It's going on the side pocket. <clears throat> so Wednesday evenings, as I understand it, are going to be uh, a little bit more teachy and less preachy. What I mean by that is that the typical mode of instruction on Sunday morning is that of using the Word of God to exhort, to authoritatively declare, and to press the conscience. And Wednesday nights, as I understand it, will be a little bit more like R.C. Sproul and less like Piper, a, a little bit more teaching in the instructional mode. So our theme today is justification by faith. We're going to have six main points here. Uh, we'll just get started. Actually, first, let's pray. Father, please help me to teach your word in a manner that's appropriate to the text. Help me, Father, to exult in your word, to be accurate, to be faithful. Help me, Father, to draw attention to you and your authority and your grace. Please open our hearts and our minds, Lord, to receive this and to enjoy it. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, firstly, uh, first of six points is that we have a, a problem. Uh, this sets us up for the need for justification by faith, but I want to define the problem in a very robust way. Uh, we cannot be made right with God. We cannot be justified before God by keeping his law because the law exposes and even provokes our sinful nature. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll tell you as we go along why I chose the wording. Um, now, Galatians 3.10 says that those who rely on the law, on works of the law, are under a curse. What's the curse? Is the curse that if you're not Jewish, you're in a bad place? What's the nature of the curse? Paul says, well, he's quoting from the Old Testament, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Is the law that condemns us, is the law that we can't be justified by, uh, a law that was merely for the Jews? Or better put, does it merely speak to the Jews? Does it merely speak to the sinful problem of the Jews? Paul teaches in Romans 2, when the Gentiles who do not have the law, so they don't have it the same way that the Jews had it, when they by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So, the law, this broad category that Paul is thinking of, law, is relevant to the Gentiles because it's not just written in the Torah, it's written on the heart of everyone, including the Gentiles. And Gentiles uh, won't be able to say at final judgment, I didn't have your law. Because God can say, you lived in part as though there was a right and a wrong, as though God's law for morality was impressed upon your very heart. You lived as though this was at least a, a, a governing reality that you were dealing with. Paul, later in Romans says to Christians, owe no one anything except to love one another. <clears throat> For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. So there's even a sense in which Christians are to have the law fulfilled in their living, their ethical living. So Paul is thinking very broadly here of law. He's not merely thinking about Jewish aspects of the Mosaic law. So 
to this provocative point here. The law is not merely a problem for us because it presents a high standard of perfection. That is a problem for us. Love your neighbor, do not covet, do not lie, honor your mom and dad. We're already in a bad place with that because it demands that we keep all of the commandments all of the time and do so well. That's a problem, but we have an additional problem. Paul teaches in Romans 7, which shall we say, what then shall we say that the law is sin? By no means. Yet if, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from me, I'm sorry, from apart from, for apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So, uh, it's not merely that the law has a high perfection standard. It's that when you come into contact with the explicit nature of the law, do not covet. You know what your flesh does? <clears throat> Covets more. Have you ever seen this with kids? Don't do that. And there's the forbidden fruit mentality. You want to do it even more. There's something about the pure and holy and righteous and good law that when you encounter it, your sin problem increases. That's a pretty bad place to be in. So the law is not a solution to our sin problem. This is a cool verse. Now, we know that whatever the law says, I want you to think here about an iceberg and the water exposes a tip of the iceberg. You see the tip of the iceberg, and the tip of the iceberg of the law is stuff like kosher keeping, dietary restrictions, circumcision, Sabbath keeping. It's external, distinctive Jewish badges. Oh, that's, he does that because he's Jewish. But when you go underneath the water and you look at the rest of the iceberg, the rest of the law has universal moral impl uh, implications for the rest of humanity. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. I want you to look at that phrase right there. Oh no, there we go. It's a cool feature here. Works of the law. See that? There's some people who say, well, that's merely talking about circumcision and dietary restrictions. But look at what just Paul, Paul just said. By works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Why? Because it excludes Gentiles? That's not the deepest reason here. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. The law exposes our sin problem. The, the law puts a magnifying glass on our sin nature. Okay. Oh, here's, fun. here's a fun one. How is the law inadequate to save us? You guys, you guys choose one. I'll give you a couple seconds here. A, it exposes our sin. B, it excludes Gentiles. C, it only concerns external righteousness. There's people that I talk to who think B and C are the right answers. They think that the law is the problem because it excludes Gentiles or because it's very externally focused. But if you really read the law, you realize, wow, the law requires internal, heartfelt, perfect, interior purity, holiness, and righteousness. And its exclusion of the Gentiles is not our deepest problem. It exposes our sin. Number two, justification is a judicial declaration that one is righteous. And I'm jealous here. I really want to convince you that justification is not something that makes you morally fit. It is not renovative. Uh, God is both a surgeon and a judge. 
In justification, he is not playing the role of a surgeon. He's playing the role of judge. Uh, Justification, the definition, in part, is that it is a declaration that one is righteous. It is forensic and it is judicial. Think with me here. Exodus 23, verse 7, keep your distance from a false charge, charge. Do not kill the innocent and the righteous, for I will not justify the wicked. He's not going to treat someone who's wicked as though they're righteous. I'm not going to call them righteous. Luke 7, 29, and all the people that heard Jesus, that is, and the publicans justified God and baptized, being baptized with the baptism of John, so they justified God. Uh, in modern translations, they, they called God righteous. They said, God is good, God is great, God is righteous. They called God righteous. Were the people celebrating here making God righteous? No, they were declaring what righteousness God already had in the person of Jesus. This is another one. Deuteronomy 5, 25, verse 1. If there is a dispute between men and they go to court and the judges decide their case and they justify the righteous and condemn the wicked, and then he gives some, he, Moses gives some stipulations here, but look at the phrase here, and they justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. So he's looking here at unjust behavior. Look at the contrast. To, to justify is to treat someone like they're not wicked. And this is a scenario where, I'm sorry, I'll read the rest of the verse. Then it shall be, if the wicked man deserves to be beaten, the judge shall make him lie down and be beaten in his presence with the number of stripes according to his guilt. So the thing I really wanted to point out here is that when a judge or a court condemns the wicked, they're not making a person wicked. Right? When someone's condemned as wicked, they're being declared as wicked, identified as wicked. And when a person who's righteous is declared to be righteous, that declaration doesn't make them righteous. It doesn't morally transform their their character. It declares their character. So justification either transforms our moral character or it is a legal declaration. Okay, there's an apparent problem. God justifies unrighteous people. That's at least superficially, a problem. Because if you're in a courtroom and a judge looks at a wicked man who did something wicked to someone you love, and the judge says to that person, you are guiltless, you are righteous. Well, in the human economy of things, in God's eyes, that is wicked. Psalm 17, 15, he who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. What a terrible thing it is to say to a wicked person, you are righteous. Or to a righteous person to say, you are wicked. That's, a, that's an abomination to God. That should make you go, uh-oh. Isaiah 5, 22. Woe to those who are hero, heroes in drinking wine and valiant men in drinking strong drink who justify the wicked for a bribe. Isaiah 53, verse 11. It's a very beautiful chapter of the Bible, looking forward to the Messiah. And it says, if you look here, that that he, the righteous one, will justify the many as he bears their iniquities. These are people who have iniquities, And the Messiah is going to justify them. He's going to call them righteous. How do we see a biblical resolution to this? Let that sit with you for a minute. God justifies, he declares unrighteous people righteous. And he declares a righteous person to be sent, Jesus. God is right 
to declare unrighteous people righteous because he credits them with a righteousness that is not their own. Justification has two essential aspects. One, it is declarative. It is a legal, forensic declaration. Righteous, not guilty. The second aspect of justification is called its constitutive aspect. Constitutive justification. Without the second aspect, the first doesn't work. The second aspect is what we might call imputation. So let's look at this. And this is what all these previous verses have built up to. Romans 3.21, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward to be a propitiation, that's a wrath-appeasing sacrifice that satisfies the justice of God, to be received by faith. So he, God put forward Christ as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show whose righteousness? God's righteousness. Because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. God having passed over former sins, God having forgiven people, presents a problem. God needs to be justified. Because you don't typically think of a judge who overlooks the guilt of a criminal as being a good judge. So God needs to be justified in some sense, vindicated in some sense. How can you be a good and just God and do that? Because of the propitiation of Christ, his blood. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So this is a doozy right here, 2, Timothy, 2 Corinthians 5.21. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This should initially shock you. Christ, who knew no sin, was made to be sin. Huh? Christ, who knew no sin, was made to be sin. In what sense? And if you can grasp this right here, you'll, you'll maybe get justification. Christ wasn't made sin by being made a sinner. Christ wasn't made sin by having his nature corrupted. He committed no sins and yet was made sin. Can you find any, any sinful thoughts or actions in the person of Christ? No. Yet he is made to be sin. Look at the last half. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The same way that Jesus was made to be sin is the same way we were made to be the righteousness of God. Christ wasn't made sin by being made a sinner. And we were not made to be the righteousness of God by being morally transformed and renovated and made better people. Does God sanctify his people? Yes. But that's not how here he makes us the righteousness of God. So this is getting into the territory 
that we might call double imputation. These nerdy terms can be glorious. Bear with me. Your sin was credited to Christ. Your sin was imputed to Christ. It was accounted to Christ. Your sin was reckoned to Christ. Christ was reckoned a sinner on your behalf. Think of here of an accounting language, crediting, reckoning language. Christ's righteousness was imputed to the believers, credited toward the believers. So if you're in a courtroom and a judge stands up on, you know, if he declares that the plaintiff is a millionaire, a judge just can't make someone a millionaire. The, the declaration isn't enough to make you a millionaire. If the judge says, Jim, you are hereby a millionaire. Okay, that's not true. <laughs> if God had done that without the sacrifice of Christ and without the legal transfer, the legal exchange that we just spoke of, he would also be engaged in empty talk, vanity, fiction, legal fiction. But because the judge transferred his own wealth, or better put, because you were united to the judge in perhaps a marriage, and her wealth became your wealth. Shared bank account. Now, her money is your money. Christ's righteousness is my righteousness. Philippians 3. He, he says, middle part, For his sake I have, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So, the righteousness that Paul glories in isn't his own Righteousness. This is what theologians call an alien righteousness. Teenagers that should make you go, what? It's an alien righteousness. It's somebody else's righteousness. It's external righteousness. The righteousness of Jesus Christ becomes your righteousness by faith. So where's the title on that? In justification, dot, 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 Christ, or God, A, only imputes our sin to Christ. Ooh, typo there, sorry. Only imputes our sin to Christ. B, both imputes sin to Christ and his own righteousness to believers. Or C, declares us righteous because of the virtue we have after sanctification. So, I'm sorry for the typos, but imagine some alternatives here. Uh, imagine, so this is, there are real religions that hold these alternative positions that your sin is credited to Christ, but you, his righteousness is not credited to you. That's the position of some theologians. Others say that when you demonstrate your faith, God looks at that faith and says, that is your righteousness. So imagine I took a quarter out of my pocket and I threw it at you. And I pointed at the quarter and I said, that's your wealth. In, the view, in this view, uh, Christ looks at your faith and he says, that is your righteousness. And this reminds me of the modern view of authenticity, where somebody has a grievous, gross sin to confess and they tweet about it, or they go on the Washington Post, and the title of the Washington Post article is, so-and-so opens up about... And they are so authentic and so honest. And the cultural ethos today is that the virtue of their authenticity should inspire you to think of them as a good person. And it outweighs their sin. So some people think the virtue of being honest and authentic 
is what makes you culturally right before others. And you can virtue signal your authenticity, and that'll make up for your sins. That's not how God thinks of your faith. He doesn't look at your faith and say, wow, your faith is so impressive, I'm going to call you righteous. No. Five. Empty-handed faith is the only fitting instrument for receiving justification. It's not the ground. Faith is not the basis for our justification. It's the instrument for receiving our justification. Get it? Faith is like, it's like you go to the dollar store and you buy a $1 band. And then you go to the mall and you get a $17,000 diamond. And you ask the jeweler, the jeweler to put, what do you call them? Who attached the parts? I don't know what you call them. But you, a, you ask him to attach the diamond on the $1 band. Faith takes hold of the diamond. But faith itself is not impressive in God's sight. It's not what makes you righteous. Faith isn't the thing. Faith lifts something other else up. Faith draws attention to something outside of itself. Faith is very fitting as an instrument for receiving the free gift of justification because it leans on the righteousness of another. Faith doesn't inherently boast of its own righteousness. Faith doesn't, it's not oriented toward boasting in itself because it's other oriented. Faith leans on and rests on the righteousness of another. And that makes faith uniquely and solely fitting as an instrument for receiving the free gift of the legal righteousness that God credits us in Christ Jesus. This is the verse that wrecked me in high school. Lusty, addicted to sexual sin, arrogant, hated my mom, lazy at school. The list goes on. And I remember trying to be more ethical and more righteous and kind of, can I go, can I go a week without doing some bad things? Can I, get, can I get 10 days in? Can I get three days in? Can I go 24 hours without doing something shameful? And I felt like I was waiting to get to a place with God's help to be right enough, good enough, righteous enough. And I read this and it wrecked me. Romans 4, verse 4, Now to, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. So if you are a pizza delivery employee, at the end of your two weeks, when you receive your paycheck, hopefully it is not a gift. You have worked for it. It is owed to you. It's a contractual obligation to the one who works his, his what? His what? His wages are not counted as a what? As a gift, but as his due. It's indebted to you. And to the one who does not work. But believes on him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted as righteousness. Now, I read that, and I thought, I'm ungodly, and I can't work to earn this, and I need you, God, to go to the bottom of me right now and forgive me for who I am. And this verse gave me permission, in a sense, to do that. It said, God, will you just forgive me right now without waiting to improve me? Will you declare me accepted and loved and adopted and forgiven and righteous right now. I need you. And I declared spiritual bankruptcy. I stopped going to the temp agency and asking God for help to earn my own employment wages. And I went to the welfare office and I took my hands, as it were, and I emptied them and I said, God, I have nothing to offer. Please give me forgiveness. 
and he gave it. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Romans 5, 16. And the free gift is not like the result of the one man sin, Adam, but the judgment following one trespass, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness. Receive what? The free gift of righteousness. Reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Final point. Well, no. (laughs) I'm going to expose it a little bit. Justification involves, by faith, the receiving of the free gift of righteousness. So it's not a righteousness you've earned. It's not a righteousness that came from within. It's outside of you, and then it's received. And it comes through the one act of righteousness of Jesus Christ. Biblically, you could even argue it's more than the one act of righteousness. It's this whole substitutionary life, sinless, obedient life. Six. Because of justification by faith, we cannot boast in ourselves, or in our ethnicity. So, uh, alert here. Alternative views of justification say that justification is not a legal declaration of you being righteousness. There's no double imputation. Some would say instead justification is a gracious inclusion of you into the covenant community of God's people. And they say, well, the boasting problem that first century Jews had was not a boasting problem of their individual self-righteousness. So some scholars that I don't agree with would argue that first century Jews did not have a problem with thinking they could earn their own salvation. They did not have a problem of being self-righteous. Instead, it is argued, these people boasted in their ethnic membership, their nationalistic pride. They said, God graciously made me a Jew, a child of Abraham. And therefore, by his grace, I am in the right community, and I'm a Jew now. And that is my righteousness, my membership, my ethnicity, my group. So what I'm saying to you here is that the Bible presents a more Uh, multifaceted boasting problem of the Jews. That they both uh, boasted of their ethnicity, their group identity, their Abrahamic lineage, and in their self, meritorious, earning, gross, arrogant righteousness. I'll tell you a story real quick. I won't read it. I'll just tell the story. Luke 18, there's two men tax collector, uh, and a Pharisee. And the Pharisee uh, approaches the temple and and says to God, thank you, Lord, that I'm not like that tax collector over there. I pay my tithes. And he lists off his personal moral achievements. But what he does is he said, I think So the Pharisee said, it's really, it's really crafty here. Think about this. The Pharisee says, he, he didn't take credit for his own righteousness. This is really tricky. He's really perverse. Listen very carefully. The Pharisee did not say, Lord, accept me, for I have produced my own righteousness. The Pharisee instead says, I thank you, God, that I am not like that man over there. So he still pointed to his own personal righteousness, but he gave God credit for it. I'm a good person, but that's only because of the grace of God. But I'm a good person, and I'm not like him. 
And then Jesus presents the picture of another man who is a tax collector who will not even look up and he pounds his chest and he says, God, I am not worthy to be called your son. Have mercy on me, a sinner. So he appeals to the mercy of God in light of his own personal lack of righteousness. And Jesus asks, which of those went, I think he just says, that man went home justified. That unrighteous, ungodly man went home declared righteous. So that presents a picture, too, of the, the, the self-righteousness. And then lastly, last verse here, Romans 3, 27. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. So, what is it that takes the wall of separation between the Jews and the Gentiles and just demolishes the wall and unites people in Christ from both ends of the aisle together as one community. It is justification by grace through faith, not by works. The justification, the righteousness of God, credited as a gift to the empty-handed believing believer excludes both kinds of boasting. I'm not righteous by virtue of my own merit or the merit of the group I belong to. So it creates a community. So in summary, we're justified by faith apart from works of the law, but works of the law here do not merely have in view covenant badges or external Jewish things like dietary restrictions or circumcision. The larger iceberg, of, as it were, of the moral failure to which our law, to which the God's law exposes uh, renders us condemned. And justification is not God being impressed with our faith, and it's not God renovating us, making us good people, and then saying, therefore you are righteous. It is instead God looking at us ungodly, enemies, unrighteous, and all we have is empty-handed faith, and him crediting an external Righteousness accomplished by Christ to us, fittingly received by the instrument of faith, not as the basis of our justification, but as the instrument of receiving justification. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this glorious doctrine. Let it be of great comfort to my brothers in Christ. If my brothers or sisters find themselves stained with guilt and shame and sin, uh, even, Lord, the very next morning, would you please let their recourse be in the righteousness of Jesus Christ by faith, not their own moral improvement. Father, would you please melt our hearts with this gospel and let that transform us in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.